Welcome to another episode of the People Who Read People podcast. This is March 16th, 2019. And today I'm talking to jujitsu and MMA expert Robert Drysdale. Hey, Robert, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me, Zach. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And we're going to talk about uh, a few things today. We're going to talk about behavior uh, prediction and anticipating opponents' behavior. But before that, let me just give you a quick rundown if you're not familiar with Robert. Uh, he's a well-known name in the jiu-jitsu and MMA community. He's been doing this since 1998. He's traveled around the world, lived and trained in Brazil for a while, where he won multiple national and world titles. Some of his titles include the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation World Championship as a black belt in 2005. In 2007, he won the prestigious ADCC Submission Wrestling World Championship. Uh, in 2016, he won a Legacy Fighting Championship. Uh, he's done a lot more, but those are just a few of the, the, the more prominent ones. And in 2008, he opened Drysdale's Jiu-Jitsu Training Gym, which is in Las Vegas. We're going to start talking about uh, some general some general questions first for some people who may not be that familiar with MMA, mixed martial arts, and uh, jujitsu. So let's start out with a, a quick rundown for people who may not be that familiar with MMA and fighting. Can you do a really quick explanation about the different styles of fighting and how jujitsu fits into that? Sure. Well, uh, in a nutshell, um, you know, early my Japanese migration to Brazil, you know, early in the 20th century. Uh, they bring style that, you know, today we refer to as judo. At the time, it was called interchangeably judo and jiu-jitsu. And it becomes popular. There's this, uh, there's this uh, um, you know, this this, uh, this curiosity about the East and Eastern arts and martial arts in general. And it becomes somewhat popular in Brazil during a period there. And Brazilians catch on to it and they really like it. based uh, Basically, off of that curiosity and off of that Brazilian experience with Japanese martial arts, Two different arts uh, came from these early uh, Japanese immigrants. One of them was uh, called Valitudo. Today we refer to it as MMA, mixed martial arts. And the other one is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is really a variation of Japanese Judo. And both these martial arts are developing at the same time in Brazil. They're with the practitioners. If you do one, normally you do the other. And that's how it's always been up to very recently. But basically, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu specializes on the ground. The difference between Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo is that judo is very stand-up oriented, very takedown oriented with very little groundwork, whereas Brazilian jiu-jitsu is the exact opposite. It has very little takedown work with a lot of groundwork. Uh, MMA was, you know, long story short, it was created as a testing ground amongst different styles uh, in Brazil, everything from capoeira to boxing, Greco-Roman, catch wrestling, judo, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and they were testing one style against the other. And this is very, very briefly. And what came from that was the sport of MMA. The MMA was brought to the United States uh, in 93 through the UFC, the foundation of the UFC. And it's after that, I mean, the rest of it is history. It's one of the most widely recognized sports in the world. And uh, it's very entertaining. But it was born in Brazil in the 1930s. Yeah, I guess uh, one thing that some people might not know who aren't familiar with the you know professional fighting area is uh, – Jiu-jitsu is not a doesn't involve any strikes. It's just a uh, a grappling and a submission, getting people in submission holds. Right? Correct. There's no, there's no, there are no punches. I, I mean, you know, pre uh, Meiji jiu-jitsu would have what we refer to as Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It is it's a grappling style. So instead of just wrestling for a takedown, you're wrestling for a takedown, but as well as to get an arm bar or a foot lock or a choke, and that's how you win the fight. You win by a submission, not by a takedown. Right. And then, and then when you get into, uh, you know, when you decide to compete in the MMA world, you have to, but you have to learn those other things like the, you know, the boxing and the, and the strikes and everything to be a well-balanced MMA competitor because M MMA is everything, whereas jujitsu is just a, a focus set of uh, rules. Absolutely. So, you know, early on in the early days of the UFC, you know, what was so enchanting about Brazilian jiu-jitsu that, you know, these Brazilians were winning these fights in a way that wasn't orthodox. The Western perception of martial arts was very much Hollywood-based. Uh, so we still had Bruce Lee in mind. We had the Karate Kid in mind. We had boxers in mind. And these Brazilians are winning on the ground. That was very unexpected. It was like almost like a cheap shot. Like, why are you winning on the ground? You're not supposed to take the fight to the ground. Well, if there are no rules, then I am allowed to take you to the ground. But as the sport evolved, and obviously, you know, just having – uh, one this uh, array of our, uh, you know one weapon is not going to be enough to win a fight once the fighters become more acquainted with ground fighting and that's exactly what happened as was predicted 
uh, you know, you have these Brazilian guys who are no longer winning with just a jitsu and they had to work on their striking and the strikers had to work on their ground. And the result was this entirely new style. I really feel that MMA today is its own style. It is no longer a testing ground for karate versus sumo wrestling, for example. It has become a style in itself and the best form of self-defense and fighting ever devised is what has come from uh, out of the UFC. One question I had, you know, watching some footage recently was, you know, people have to compete, at, uh, have to learn these different styles. Do you feel like having to get good at the, all of those styles when you do MMA, do you feel like it prevents you from being super good at one style? It's an interesting question, you know, that, that specialization versus being a jack of all trades, master of nothing type. Uh, you know, in the UFC, you still see some guys who are excessively good with their hands and have very little ground skills. And you see the opposite as well, right? But I feel that's a dying breed. I think that the general trend is moving towards fighters that are becoming more and more alike because it's a selection process that's going on, right? What works stays. What doesn't work, it's weeded out. If something is work consistently, then it's work consistently, that means it's being trained consistently. If something that is consistently not working, then there's no point of training it, right? As a result, like all fighters are, you know, more or less slowly moving in the same direction as far as the technical development goes. And it's, you know, like once again, there are people that have their specialties, but I feel that that's a dying breed. Mm -hmm. there, yeah, it's, it's moving towards sort of this more data driven. It's like we know these maneuvers, these moves are are like the most effective. So everyone just starts concentrating on those more like optimal uh, strategy uh, situations. Yeah, correct. That's that's exactly what's, which is kind of what is, you know, you have a certain rule set and it's just sometimes it takes a time for the competitors to find what are the best strategies within that rule set the rule set sets the boundaries of what is you know permitted and then right. the strategies will be based on how far can i get to this border without crossing the border and doing something illegal right or something efficient and you know as a result all fighters end up going more or less in the same direction yeah it's kind of i guess you could make an analogy to anything like sort of like poker it started out as kind of like wild west there weren't any rules the, the the play was actually pretty bad and all over the place but then over the years you know people learned what actually worked what were the best strategies and you started seeing everybody you know play the same sorts of strategies because those you know they were just the recognized as the best strategies uh and i just wanted to throw in here i wanted to give a shout out to elliot Rowe, who is a mind coach hypnotherapist and he uh i know elliot and Robert also knows Elliot, so I just wanted to give a shout out because he had the idea to to hook me and Robert up for this. And uh, yeah, you can see if you're curious about Elliot, his website is PokerMindCoach.com. So just want to throw that in there. Great guy. Yeah. I'll throw in a word for him as well. Great guy. He's helped me a lot in my fight, so highly recommend it. Uh, so let's get into uh, more of the behavioral stuff. I wanted to start with a uh, quote I read yesterday, which because I thought it was kind of connected to this interview. I read this quote in this, uh, it was basically a study about karate interviewing people anonymously. So I don't really have the guy's name, but apparently it was a second degree black belt. And he said, knowing how to anticipate an opponent means actually preventing or neutralizing every attempt at action. In my opinion, however, not all athletes have the ability to be in tune with the opponent, recognize an intention or action and anticipate it in good time. I believe that this quality in the evaluation of an athlete should be considered in the same way as physical strength, flexibility, speed, and so on. And so uh, I wondered if you agree with that general idea that predicting an opponent's action is a, is a huge part of being successful at, at fighting. I think it's the most important thing. And when, when I'm predicting, I think that, I mean, predicting can mean a lot of different things, but I, I, I normally word it to my students as anticipation, right? I think that ultimately what has happened in fighting is like these microsecond races, and, like, and, and, and it really comes down to the, the, the quarter of a second sometimes, less than that. Uh, and who's going to get there first? And that's going to give me the edge, which sets the dynamic for the next few seconds of the fight, right? So really what it comes down to is anticipation in the sense where I have to know where you're going to be before you're there. So if you think, you know, people always talk about chess and how complex chess is. I'm like, I'm like no, I don't care how much, I don't care what chess players say, fight is way more complex because it's chess with the body, not with. You know, it's, it's not two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional. And additionally, it's there's a lot of emotion involved. I mean, I'm sure there's emotion in chess too, but like, I don't think it's the same as, as having someone punch you in the face inside a cage, you know? Uh, you, right. They're not on, the, the, the kind of anxiety you deal with, they're very, very different. But 
Uh, and, and really what you're, it is like chess, it's human chess. You're trying to outdo your opponent. You're trying to set traps for him. You're trying to get them to make a split second mistake and beat him to the punch. And, and there's another aspect that, you know, is more obvious and, but it's also factored into fighting, which is the athletic ability. We're not the same, despite what people say, we're not clones. Some people have more muscle fiber density, more red blood cells, bigger heart, you know, longer limbs, and these things all play a role as well on top of that. But going back to your question, there's, I think that the anticipation of being in the right place at the right time, knowing that your opponent's going to be there, so in a way predicting their behavior, is single-handedly the most important aspect of fighting, but it's also the most difficult one to train because it's so deep into your psyche. It's not mm -hmm. that it's not on the outer layer of your behavior. It's not something you can drill in the gym, it's, I mean, to some extent you can, but a lot of it has to do with your mindset and your approach to fighting. And I don't have a clear answer as how that works in the mind. My suspicion is that it is so, to some degree genetically determined. Uh, mm -hmm. It has to do with maybe your upbringing, how you feel about the world that day. I think there's a lot more going on in the mind, that things that we don't understand. Um, I can speak for myself. I can't speak for other people. But with me, it was always like this little voice in the back of my head that like it wasn't like not being there first wasn't an option. The option of like, what if or what if he beats me to it or if I'm slow? There's no hesitation. It was always like, I'm going to win this split second fight. And these split second little battles are ultimately what determine the outcome. So this might be a good spot to throw this in. I was reading yesterday some thoughts on how great fighters might be really feeling what their opponents are doing by using what they call mirror neurons, you know, which are these neurons in the brain that activate the same when we do something. They activate the same way, whether we're doing something or whether we're watching someone else do something. Yeah. So it was it was thought like maybe we're like actually, you know, mirroring these these moves we're seeing in our brain and really connecting to our opponent when we're when we're fighting them. And I wondered if you kind of related to that. I, I wondered if it, it, when you were having, when you felt the best when you were fighting, did it feel like I really like am inside this guy's head and I, I kind of understand his, you know, Funny, really feel what he's going through. This is something me and Elliot went over in detail. Uh, this is something that I actually talk, spoke about this uh, in class. I taught class this morning and we were talking a little bit about this. So I do this visualization drill. And, I, and I, it's funny because I was talking to Elliot about this when I was doing therapy with him. And it's something I've always done. But I'd play this movie reel in my head, and I'd played it, like, when I say thousands of times, like, I'm not exaggerating. Like, it was literally the only thing on my mind to the point where I wasn't social before a fight. Like, you couldn't hold a conversation with me because I was too busy watching the movie. And it, what I would do is I was, you know, I if you have an, an idea of your strengths and you understand your opponent's strengths, you have an idea of where no man's land is going to be, right? That's what I call it. I call it no man's land, where the fight takes place. So I know where my first trench is. I know where your first trench is. So I know exactly where the fight takes place. And I know what your strategies are. I know my strategies. And I know that you know that I know that you know, right? So when you understand all these things, you have an idea of what's going to happen in the fight. What I would do with these visualization drills is I would like see the likely scenarios in my head over and over and over. And I would visualize all the possible outcomes and all the things that he may do based on his strengths and my weaknesses and so on. And I would play the, that movie in my head over and over and over and over. And it, mm -hmm. it's always helped me. Like I've always felt that because when the time comes and you're exhausted and your brain's deprived of blood flow and oxygen and you're not thinking straight because, you know, you're, you're on autopilot. You can barely hear your coach. I feel like the mind kind of fires in a rapid way when it's been programmed to, you know, to play the movie versus mm -hmm. me trying to figure out on the spot what the best decision is. The mind itself, consciousness, I feel it's too slow. So I feel like the subconscious has to be somewhat, some degree programmed through this movie. And when I play that movie over and over and over, I feel that when the time comes, there's no hesitation. And like the hesitation is exactly what we were talking about earlier, is that not beating the opponent to the punch. It's not being able to predict your opponent's reactions because you're too busy you know, thinking or not, you know, the program is not right or you're doing the wrong things. Whereas if you got the right program set in, the, you know, in, in, in your behavior, then your body's responding so much faster. You don't have to think about it and there's no hesitation. And you're able to outpace your opponent on those split second fights I was telling you about. 
Yeah, that makes uh, makes a lot of sense actually, because you're kind of like running this, you know, loose simulation and, and using that visualization in your mind and like, you know, knowing what you know about him, knowing what you know about you, just using that to create like a mental movie. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. It reminds me of that. Uh, you probably have heard of that old study from like the 80s where uh, just by imagining throwing free throws, they improve just as much as the people who actually spent time throwing free fr- throws. I don't know if you ever heard that study. I haven't heard of it, but I totally believe it. It's funny because like in jiu-jitsu, there's this huge debate about how much you should drill. And I have never – I've always been disciplined in the sense where I show up to the gym every day. It didn't matter if it was snow and raining, if I were sick, injured. In that sense, I've always been good. But there's certain things that I hated doing. Like, and, you know, I probably should have been better about it. But I hated like – repetition like doing the same thing over and over it was never fun to me it was boring like i wasn't it wasn't engaging it wasn't challenging but one thing i've always done a lot was visualization i've always visualized a lot over and over my head and i think the mind doesn't always like goes back to that mirror uh you were talking about i think the mind doesn't always understand the difference between physically doing something and and having your mind actually execute that um right one example i always give and maybe if you maybe you know people who don't fight may or may not relate to this example but I've given this example to my students before, and I go, if you close your eyes and you try to execute a move you're really good at, try to do it. And they close their eyes. You have no problems executing a move you have, you know, that you are familiar with. And if I try to, okay, close your eyes and try to execute a move that you're not familiar with, you're not good at, and you've never pulled off in practice, and you can't do it. It's funny. Like, I, I, I can't do certain things that I can't see myself doing in my mind. It's like there's this block. and. Mm-hmm. And it's only after I start, like, you know, if I push through that and I see, eventually I get better at it. But it's almost like this, your mind is unable to do some things unless you train it to do it. Like, and even something like imagine yourself doing a move sometimes, it's very difficult. But it's always the ones you're not familiar with. So I suspect like that, you know, that connection between the, 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 the your, your brain, your nervous system and how, to, you know, how it works in sync with your muscles is that connection is made. Even if your body is not necessarily physically doing it, mm-hmm. I've, I've always felt there are moves that I've learned that I felt like I was like Neo in the Matrix. I'd see the move and I'd see it in my head and I'd go home thinking about it. And the next day I'd be doing it. Yeah, it makes complete sense. I mean, because I've, I'm a big believer in, you know, your, your unconscious is constantly doing stuff, you know, below the surface that you don't know about. It's kind of like when you wake up in the morning and you had been thinking about a problem and you suddenly have the solution for it. You know, our unconscious is, is doing all sorts of stuff below the surface. So it's not surprising, you know all this, you know, unconscious preparation or, or visualization would, would help for all those things. Yeah. So let's get into some, uh, specific maybe tells or, you know, reads you can get, are there some common giveaways in, uh, fights, especially from the less experienced fighters where they really telegraph their next action or maneuver? Are there certain ones that really stand out as common, reliable kind of tells? Uh, yeah, the people fall into patterns. We all do. I think the intelligent fighter needs to learn how to recognize what the patterns are and, you know, change their own patterns if it's a flaw and, you know, exploit their opponent's patterns. Uh, I think there's a lot of that going on. Uh, it's very difficult because we, we, we get in our comfort zone. It's like, you know, the best analogy I, I ever, you know, made, I could make f- for this is like, imagine if you're in a football field and you walk the same path every day across the field, it turns into a trail, right? The grass is going to die, and then you can see like a clear line. And then if you walk different paths, like if you walk it enough, it creates another one. And I think that ultimately what a fighter does, or a poker player for that matter, is you're trying to create new pathways in your brain so you're not stuck to that same you know, trail over and over and over. That same, you know, it, it, mm-hmm. it becomes predictable after a while, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've always made the effort not to be predictable. So in fighting, for, on technical terms, there are things like feints and like acting like you're doing one thing. Like I've, I've always been a grappler. So there's one thing. I didn't get to use it a whole bunch in my fights, but it's something I practice a lot with like faking the shot and, you know, following that with an overhand right and then back into the shot. There's another one that I did. I used this successfully in fights and I've used this a lot in the gym. I'd always like I'd fake a right hand. I'd change levels, faking a shot. I'd fire a left hook, and I'd go back into the shot. So it was like a four combo. It was like up, down, up, down. And the idea behind that was to throw my opponent off, not knowing what I was doing next. And it was an unpredictable behavior because everyone expected me just to shoot. So when I was throwing punches before my my, my shot or my double leg, it would land because they were they had their hands down. So – I think that's sometimes like that's something you can practice, uh, you know, you get better at over time, but it, it's definitely something that, you know, I think people don't pay attention to when it comes to strategy. Ultimately strategy is leading your opponent to 
you know, move left when you're really going right. My favorite example of this, and it's an example very difficult to mimic because like some people are just unique, but there's a soccer player in Brazil. His name was Garrincha. And if you know, if you're a soccer historian fan, you know who he is. He was absolutely brilliant. And he played in the 60s in Brazil. And he was um, he was known for doing, always faking left and going right. And that's how he got, got past people. And he would fake left and go right. He would fake left. But he did it over and over and over. And everyone knew he was going to go right. <laughs> but he faked the left. It was so good. It was so good. You couldn't stop yourself from going to your right to block his left. And he would get past people every single time the exact same way. And then just it, it was... It was predictable in a way because everyone knew what he was doing, but it was done so well. It tricked people every single time. And there are some people in fighting that can do that, but that's unique. Like I feel like those are like almost like the the exceptions. They don't switch it up, and but they're just that good at one thing. Uh, I've never been that good at anything. I've always been the kind of guy who had to like improvise and you know and and you know new strategies for new opponents. I've never been great at anything. I've been well rounded at everything. I feel like. Mm. So uh, when I was watching some footage last night, one thing I was thinking about as far as like reading people was it seems like, you know, obviously kicks are very powerful, but they also take longer to deliver, especially like if you're going to do like some, you know, um, turn and kick kind of thing. So I was wondering if uh, are there certain things you look for, certain openings to go for, you know, a big kick? Is that, is that a good a good question? I'm not even sure. Yeah, well, yeah, like I, I've never been a striker, but I've, I've I've done a lot of striking. I strike for ten years, so you know it's it's not what I'm known for. But one one rule of thumb is you never throw a kick by itself. Sometimes it does work, but for the most part, it's very predictable because you're right; it's slower and longer, and there's a bigger higher risk at it too because you know you get caught with your, your kick gets caught, and now you're getting taken down, right? Uh and, you know, it's hard to keep your hands up when you're kicking, so your hands normally can come down for mechanical purposes. Um, but generally speaking, you always throw punches before your kick. Mm. And, and the kick is 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 slower. It's a longer weapon, but it's a slower weapon. So think of like a long-range weapon versus a short-range weapon. Mm. Uh, I've had mixed experience with kicks, and I've seen a lot of people have this experience, is that, you know, people end up kicking an elbow or like a you know, foot is like not as strong as people think it is. It's not that hard to break your foot. And I've, I've kicked some elbows in my life, and it, I'm telling you, it's not fun. <laughs> Way to hurt yourself, man. Like, you kick the guy really hard, and next thing you know, you're limping for the next three days type thing. So there's that. But I think it's a huge it's, – it's, it's certainly a, a very important aspect of fighting, but I think it's fair to say that the hands are prevalent. If you look at knockout ratios of hands versus feet, it would be like – my guess would be like five to one. That would be my guess. You know, hands versus, versus kicks. Mm-hmm. Were there any any cool anecdotes that stand out in your past matches where you felt like you were really predicting someone's actions very well and really felt you know in their head? And if so, what, what kinds of factors played a role in those kinds of matches? I don't know if this is it's not on the technical level; it's more on the emotional level. And maybe that I don't know maybe that that helps or not. But it, there's always something that, I, and I've given this example in seminars before, and it's one of my favorite examples because it taught me a lesson, and it. You know, right before you're about to step on the mats, um, you know, I love you're nervous, you're anxious. You know, a lot of people, they want to come try to talk to you and shake your hand. And I've never liked that. You know, like right now you're my enemy. And truth be told, if I have to hurt you to win, I'm going to. I don't want to hurt you. But if the decision is between breaking your foot and or, or losing, I'm like, I'm going to break your foot every single time. You know, and it, it's the nature of the game, right? It's not, I'm not playing patty cakes there. It's combat. So, you know, I remember there was one time I it was the Brazilian championship in 2004, right? It was right before I got my black belt. It was a brown belt at the time. And I was I won my division, and I was in the semifinal of the Open. I'll never forget this. And the guy I was going against, he was like two weight divisions above. He was a lot heavier, very strong guy. I won't mention his name. He's like a known guy in the BJJ community. And he had won his division, two weight classes above. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I won my division, right? I'm – you know, on the podium, on the open, the open weight class, like it's a gold medal and a bronze medal. That's not bad. I'm content. It's, I call this the podium syndrome. You're content with third place, right? Because I won my division, so I was happy. I was no longer trying to win that second gold medal. I was completely okay with taking third in the second division, right? I was accepting the fact that I was going to lose to this guy. And I remember I had my hoodie on and I'm warming up right before the match. And I'm like completely defeated. Like there's no way I'm going to beat this guy. He's a lot heavier. I'm tired, blah, blah, blah. Making excuses, right, in my head. And my opponent 
And this was my saving grace because I was very nervous and he would have seen it had I not had my hoodie on. And he was right next to me warming up. And I noticed that he was checking me out like from head to toe. He kept looking me up and down and he's like acting really nervous. And like his body language and his facial expressions were very, very, like he was scared of me. Like I could read that in mm-hmm. his behavior and I could see him through the corner of my eye, the way he was like looking up me up and down. It wasn't an, mm. he wasn't trying to intimidate me. He was like, <laughs> you know, like, what am I up against? You know? And I'm like, this guy's scared of me. And he's like two weight classes of <laughs> like so much. I couldn't believe that he was scared of me, but like the more he did that, it's difficult to describe what that did to my mind. Cause I went from for sure, I'm going to lose to for sure. I'm going to win. And wow. I, I, I remember at one point I started like warming up with more intense. Like, oh, wow, he's scared. Okay. <laughs> so I started playing the part, you know, I like started to look, I became confident and that. I think that it was expressed in my body language. And when I stepped on the mats, I, I beat him that day. It wasn't by a lot, but I beat him. And I was, you know, I ended up winning the whole division that day. I got my black belt the next day. Uh, uh-huh. we, I owned the whole tournament for the team. We were like three points behind the, 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 the other, one of our competitors and my gold medal in the open weight class gave us the win of that whole tournament. So it was like a huge day for me, right? And it was all uh-huh. because I had a hoodie on and he couldn't read my mind. <laughs> and I really feel that was why, because I could see how scared he was of me. And what it, the lesson it taught me was no matter how much it hurts, no matter how much pain you are, no matter how scared you are, you never, ever show it. Hmm. It feeds into your opponent. Like they feed off of that. Like, and I, I've, I've been on both ends, you know, and it, it does play a role. I, I truly mm-hmm. believe that, you know, showing that confidence in your body language and your eye contact and all of that is a factor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. I, I was, that leads me into my next question, which was going to be about, you know, how uh, you see a lot of uh, kind of intimidating behavior before a fight. And uh, some of it's, you know, pretty over the top, but um, you know, how, Part of that must just be for that, you know, they're they're pumping themselves up, and you also want to intimidate your opponent because, like you just said, it, that, that can be very important. Yeah, I, there's there's there are two things going on. One, they know the cameras are on, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, like I've had the opportunity to coach on the Ultimate Fighter before, and it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's very obvious that everyone's behavior changes the second the cameras are on. They know they're being filmed. So th- it's real, but it's not. It's real in the sense where they're really yelling at each other and there's no script, right? They're really, you know, they're really, you know, getting in each other's face and it's real in that sense. But as soon as they would not do that if the cameras were off. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Like they only do in that because the cameras are on, right? So mm-hmm. it's it's hard to explain. It's real and it's not real. Um I, I never liked that, to be honest. I, I'm, I, I'm all for showing confidence. I don't like smack talk. I think that respect comes first. Mm-hmm, More mm-hmm. important than you know, selling tickets is being respectful towards people who do the exact same thing you do. Uh, but I'm the minority in, in, in that regard. I'm a dying breed. Like, I'm an old school martial artist. Like, in this day and age, like, you know, if you think like me, you're broke. But it's, it is what sells tickets because the crowd understands drama more than they understand fight. The truth is the average fan doesn't have a clue of what, what's going on in the fight. But everyone understands the soap opera aspect of it. So mm-hmm. that's pretty mm-hmm. much why they're doing But there's also the intimidation factor. Like I feel that, for example, the best example here is I really feel that Conor McGregor got into Jose Aldo's head. I mm. think that like he upset Jose Aldo so much that he made Jose Aldo emotional. During the fight. And that's right. supposed to happen. Like your fighter is not supposed to be emotional. You're supposed to be as cold as it gets at all times. And right. it's he got into his head, you know, but Connor couldn't get into Khabib's head, for example. Khabib was too cool for that. And that made the difference in the fight. You could see Khabib lost his cool at the end of the fight. You can see he had all that emotion build up and he was just holding it back. As soon as the fight was over, you could see him jumping over the fence and like letting loose because he had been holding off that for so long. But he managed to keep it cool until the end of the fight. And that shows a lot of control. Like it takes a unique human being to be able to do that. Mm. Yeah, it seems like there's multiple reasons, you know, for that kind of behavior. It's like you've got the you've got the cameras, like you said, you've got the potential intimidation of the opponent. You've got, you know, if it, even if it's not intimidation, you make them emotional and angry, you know, at you, which can you know mess them up. And then you've got the pumping yourself up, you know, getting yourself in a confident headspace too. It seems like it for some people it might be a combination of you know one or more of those. Yeah, it's it, it. There's so many layers to this, man. That's why one reason why it's so fascinating to me. I, I can't stand the culture of MMA, to be honest. I love the art, though, like the the, the art and then the mental aspects, the physical aspects, the technical aspects. So rich, 
Mm-hmm. It's so mm-hmm. rich. There's so many different layers to it. You were, you were talking about one of the um, – that guy, your opponent, couldn't um, see your face and see your potential uh, anxiety. And I was thinking the other reason you want to hide your emotions is during a fight, you might want to hide when you're hurt, right? You want to hide – when you sustain an injury. Yeah. So it's important basically to stay stoic throughout the whole uh, match, would you say, before and after, or before and during. And that's very hard to do. Because, like, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been punched in the liver. <laughs> if you can stay – you, it takes, like, a robot, you know, like not to uh, your knees and start, like – like if people look like, oh, he just got punched in the gut, he's being a wuss. Like, no, man, you get punched in the liver, I'm telling you, it hurts. It's a whole new level of pain, man. It sucks. And you know, but like I've seen people that they show they're cool, like they they're hurt, and you can see they're they're trying to hide it. And some people hide it, like they break their hands, and you can't tell. Mm-hmm. Oh, they get kicked in the leg. It's it's very difficult. It depends on the kind of pain you're in, though. Like pain is different for everyone. I don't think everyone experiences the exact same kind of pain from the same injury. You know, like you know, some you know the connections to the, the your your pain receptors are not they're not they're all the same. Like one again, we're not clones, right? So I don't I never judge people for quitting out of pain. Because like I don't, we can't really quantify what what kind of pain they're experiencing, right? Uh, but there's a lot of that. Like I think being able to hide a weakness is is a big part of the game. Because if if you show that to your opponent, they will exploit it, and then they should. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it got me thinking when you said you know he couldn't read you or read your anxiety from the uh, from the hoodie you were wearing, and then it got me thinking about uh, the Mortal Kombat characters who cover their entire faces, you know. And I'm like, well, you, yeah, you couldn't you couldn't get a read on their nervousness, and you couldn't get a read that they were hurt. So I'm kind of like, is that ba- maybe there's some basis in in uh, martial arts? I guess ninjas used to cover up their uh, you know their face and everything. I don't know if that has like a, I think that hiding facial expressions give away way too much, uh, uh-huh. you know, and it's, I mean, I've seen studies on this, like there are thousands of facial expressions that we can make and they, and we understand them, right. As humans, like you don't have to, you can be looking at a facial expression of someone from Zimbabwe and it's the, you know, you know, if they're sad, if they're happy. Right. And universal. Yeah. Universal. It's a human universal. And I think it does give away a lot. And it's very difficult to to hide that. Like, you know, your eyes get bigger when you get excited, for example, you know, or you frown when you're upset. And it's very hard to control that. Like in day to day life, I, I, I don't do that. I have no problems expressing, you know, like if I'm upset, I'm upset. Like I'm not trying to hide it. Mm-hmm. Um, but in fighting, I think that, you know, you have to keep that cool. You have to be to have that stoic face no matter what. And like stone, you'd give absolutely nothing. Unless you're playing, you're, you can, I mean, if you're that great about controlling your your facial, exp- your body language and facial expressions, like you can act really upset when you're really happy and you mm. know, put your opponent off with things like that, you know. But it's, um, it, I, I mean, it takes a good actor. I think some good acting comes into play here. Right, that'd be a whole other level of mental space you'd have to devote to that kind of stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of free time that, that we end up like, you know, doing nothing like watching stupid movies and tv shows and like dumb conversations and there's plenty of time for improvement like we all have time it's just that we choose to do things that aren't always it just depends on how committed you are to improvement but i, I would practice this like i never i mean now, now that i think about it like i think it's something worth developing like actually practice controlling your your facial expressions and not allow them to be a mirror of what's going on in your mind you know and, and even like during the day, if you're upset one day, force yourself to smile, you know, and, and I, I think that actually might even improve on your mood. <laughs> yeah. Well, they said that, yeah, there's that study uh, I've heard where just going, you know, just, just the act of smiling, like improves your, your mood, you know? I believe like I, I, I yeah. force myself to sing. If I'm in a dark mood, I turn the radio uh-huh. up and I force myself to sing to something happy. Like I'll play Bob Marley, Three Little Birds, you know, or something like that. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I, th- I believe it helps. Like I'll force. No, for sure. Yeah, and it actually makes me feel better. Yeah, I mean, after I saw that study years ago, I, you know, I kind of felt like a maniac, but I was sometimes just driving around, you know, just start smiling, you know, because I and I believe it does help, you know. But uh, yeah, it's a lot of discipline though, because when you're in a bad mood, it's it's hard to be do anything but be in the bad mood, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like you, yeah, you don't feel like uh, making that effort. Yeah. Um. So getting back, oh, getting back to ways you might be able to predict behavior, uh, I was reading about, somebody said this quote from that, it was that same karate study that I quoted before, where somebody said, I believe I'm able to anticipate the movement of an individual prior to their attack, not only through body movement, but also from watching exactly where they are looking at me. 
So I wondered if you can relate to that as far as like, do you get any eye eye direction, uh, gaze direction kind of like tells like somebody's looking at your, you know, a certain uh, body area and that's, that makes it more likely they're going to try a certain move? I think Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, MMA, yes, but I think grappling is one of the few sports in the world where eyesight is not that important, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. A lot more feel and touch. I wouldn't say eyesight determines my anticipation mm-hmm. or my prediction. It is more the feel. I can feel them move in a certain direction. And right. When, like I call it the Spider-Man sense. You know how Spider-Man, like he knows when he's in danger before he's in danger. Like, you just feel that a building is going to be hit with a car or a building is going to fall on his head or something. Right. And I, I, I get that same feel in jiu-jitsu. Like I know when something's going wrong and I know my – sometimes I'm not even sure what my opponent's doing, but I can feel him doing it. And that's a very good instinct. I tell my students, like, if you feel you're in danger and you're not even sure what's going on, you don't want to find out. Like, you're in danger, do something about it, back out, retreat if you have to. It's a very good instinct. And that is that is a big part of, of what we do is predicting your opponent's behavior, not through sight in, in the case of grappling, more through, you know, um, it's hard to explain because it's you can feel yourself being off balance down the road, for example. Like, not right now I'm not off balance but if I let you get that one grip that you're reaching for, mm-hmm. I will be off balance. So it's like your, it's like chess again. You're predicting three, five, six moves ahead. I know it's going to happen three minutes down the road if you manage to get that grip. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I imagine. I mean, with because you're, you know, when you're grappling with somebody, you you feel so much of their body. Like you can feel, you know, you you can feel those those muscles start to move from very far away in the body. You know, from where you're gripping, I can imagine. So it's like you get a sense of which which direction they're trying to move the, right before they do it or whatever. Yeah, and I it's like I truly believe that you could be blind and be really good at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It's it doesn't help. I mean, I've seen blind people and they and they hang. They go back and forth with the good guys. Like it's not. Mm-hmm. It, it probably is one of the few sports or practices in the world where having eyesight doesn't really give you that much of an advantage. Maybe a little bit, but not a lot. Right. It's so close in. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, when we were talking about, uh, you know, fighters facing off beforehand and doing the intimidation kind of stuff or looking really stoic, do you ever hear about that study where uh, the, they asked people to look at the pictures of people before fights and rank who they thought was going to win the fight? You ever heard of that? I just read that. That's too funny. I just read that study. Like, it's just something that's recent, isn't it? Like, it's not, I'm even not talking about the same one, like how facial expressions determine victors. Like we're determining the victor. Yeah. And this one's from, yeah, it's pretty recent. I and mean, this one was 2015, but there might be another one. No, it might be, uh, 2000, I, I, 2015 to me is, I just read it like when I'm talking like three days ago. I'm not even exactly like it's just very, very recently. I saw that someone sent it to me and. Yeah, it was so just, just to sum up before you say anything, I was going to sum it up for people. So basically, they asked people to rank who they thought would win just based on the the photos alone of these two fighters. And there was an above, you know, significantly above average chance that the these people got it right. They basically guessed way above average who would win just based on, you know, who they thought looked tougher or more confident or whatever. So that that was pretty interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Although, like, I, I mean, I, I have my own doubts about that study because, like, you can select out of thousands of pictures the ones where I look intimidated and the ones I don't look intimidated, right? But yeah, yeah, there there is there is something. I don't I don't know how I don't know details of the study, but th- there is something about, like, for example, like I have pictures of me, like you know, that I could see in my eyes. And I remember, like, yeah, I was scared that day, where I was like, no, I was like, feeling super. Like you know, uh, supremely uh, confident that day, and it, it does come out. It's in you know your eyes. That's just the look. And I, I can tell when someone's quitting. Like I, I can. Mm-hmm. I have students of mine that were very gifted, but they were quitters on the mats. They just didn't want to win. Like deep down, they didn't care about winning enough. Mm-hmm. I could mm-hmm. in their eyes when they stopped fighting. Like it was just so obvious that they were just waiting for the time to run out and. You know, and they can see that other guy like he is like he'll die before he quits. You know? And I, you know, you can read this in their body language. And I, I think that even just like from the picture, yes, yeah, a lot of confidence comes across from just a still photo. Yeah, that's interesting. It makes you really think about how much is really happening below the surface there when, you know, the two guys, you know, come into the come into the ring or the octagon or whatever, you know, and they're they're looking at each other. There just must be a lot of like, you know communication there below the below the surface there is there's like a whole yeah. language that's going on and mm-hmm. yeah i i think that's interesting to me that's like fascinating it's one of my favorite things about fighting has always been that that secretive language you know that goes on and 
Um, you know, I have a friend of mine, he made a, you know, he made, he makes an analogy, like fighting is like an argument, an argument with the body. And that's a very good, just a very appropriate way of, of describing fighting. It is an argument with the body. There's like this language that's going on and it's not just physical. It's also emotional. There's mm-hmm. intimidation that's going on before and after the fight, you know, or, or before and during the fight. I mean, mm-hmm. and it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, these are all these, these are all numbers in the equation, right? It's not a small equation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how much tape watching would you, would do people usually do before a fight? Do they study their opponents, watch a lot of tape? I never liked watching tape. I, I always watched it, but I didn't like to watch it too much because I think that at some point it starts being detrimental. I never watch highlights because they make your opponents look way better than they actually are and they might mess with your head. Mm. Uh, but I, I think that watching tape is very important so you can study weaknesses. Ideally, that'd be done by your coach, though. Like the less the fighter does it. Like a fighter could do it maybe once. Like I wouldn't have – if I were training someone, I wouldn't have them watch tape more than once. And I would be, as a coach, I'd be doing most of the studying and I would base the camp preparation based off of those tapes. Because as a coach, you know, uh, you should be, you know, you're the one should be preparing what the, the, the fighter should be doing. That's a big problem in fighting. Fighters, generally speaking, they tend to surround themselves with yes, man. And if you look at the very successful ones, they always have a brain behind them that tells them exactly what to do. And it does work better that way. It's better that the fighter doesn't do a whole bunch of thinking. And you just sticks to the game plan. And if you find a good coach that has a good game plan, then you know it works better. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they filter they they filter it to the to the fighter. They and they, they, they only yeah. what they need, no more, no less. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Uh, so when you talked about you know when you're when you're grappling when you're doing jujitsu and you talked about like you know getting a sense of what the person might be doing you know through their through the muscles they're tensing or whatever are there are there some specific uh matches that come to mind where where that played a big role as far as like i knew this guy's you know he would give away a certain thing here or there anything like that come to mind as oh yeah as far as predicting oh yeah like they there were i mean there were times where I'll give you the best example because I've given this example in interviews like so many times. When I won that ADCC championship, the final, I was the underdog by a lot. And I remember I was in the final, I had some really good matches, and I beat some really good guys leading up to that final. And I walked in that that open weight class, you know, like kind of like, well, whatever happens, happens, right? And kind of with a little bit of the podium syndrome, maybe. Like I took third in my weight class, and I walk into the open weight class, which is the most prestigious one. And I'm going, let's see what happens, you know. But I beat some really good guys, and my confidence level went up. But by the time I made it to the final, I knew my opponent really well. I knew what he was going to do. I knew exactly where I didn't want to be. And, like, it was – I wasn't – I'd gone through that fight in my head, you know, like leading up to that final. And I knew exactly how he was going to try to win, and I knew exactly how I was going to beat him. And it's funny because I remember vividly – like, man, this gives me goosebumps because I remember this so well – this was 12 years ago, but it's it's like it happened yesterday. I I remember smiling and like like laughing, almost like giggling, like right before the final. Like I was, and my best friend was was with me at the time. Like, dude, focus, man. You're about to the most important fight of your life, man. Get your shit together. And I'm going like, and I and I was smiling because I was celebrating because I had already won. It's hard to explain how I felt because I'd only felt that way maybe three, four times my whole life where I was absolutely 100% sure I was going to win exactly the way I knew I was going to win. It's exactly how it happened. You know, I, I walked in there and I remember like, it was so confident. I was just like, remember this guy's like, he's one of the greatest grapplers of all time. And he's, uh, uh, um, like he was certainly the favorite, but I was probably the only person in that arena who was a hundred percent sure I was going to win. Hmm. And yeah, it's it went funny, but it exact it went exactly how I had visioned in my head, and it was one of the biggest days of my life. So it was almost like some unconscious stuff clicked, and you just you do you, for whatever reason you just you just knew it was going to happen. Yeah. It's very very unique place to be, and I and I wish I could be in that place every day of my life. Yeah, you know, it, it got me. It, you reminded me of something I was thinking about before, where sort of it, I think we've all been there in different you know, different endeavors and pastimes where you're just like, I just know, you know, what's going on in this situation. Like in poker, for example, you might have a read where you're just like, I just know much more than usual. I'm, I'm like certain that this person's bluffing or whatever. And, um, you know, it's, in, it would be interesting to study that kind of certainty. Like, for example, like to, to record those instances where you or anybody was certain before a match, or if somebody was certain that somebody was bluffing and like kind of study, like how, you know, 
how how that actually happens and, and uh, try to find the factors I, I, behind I, that. You know? if it's, but it's so hard to see. So I mean, for myself, like, I've been there so few times in my life. But if there were a drug that got me to that place, I'd probably be addicted to that drug, man, because it would. Mm-hmm. It is the most beautiful place I've ever been to in my mind. There's never been a place that was so peaceful and happy. Mm. And it was, it's where, you know, it's one of those, there's certain things in life that you can't explain. You can't, you can only have to experience it, right? Like you can't explain having, you know, you're picking up your child for the first time. Like they're, you know, very first child. You can't explain that to someone who's never had kids. There are certain experiences in life you just can't explain. Like having your hand raised is one of them. But like, had that experience of feeling that 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 supreme sense of confidence that no one can defeat you is one of probably the greatest feeling I've ever had in my life. Right. I guess it's also you know you you wouldn't be sure if you, because you had that feeling you won or did you you know or did you have that feeling because the things were aligned for you to win. You know, like was it a chicken and egg kind of thing? Like if you can rep- replicate that feeling, maybe you could win a lot. But or maybe you were just feeling that because because you knew everything was aligned for you, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, yeah. If, if we if whoever figures out how to replicate that is will we'll change the world. Yeah, it's a very- be like the the winning the winning drug. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, are there certain opponent poses, stances, or behaviors you look for when it's time to go from uh, you know um, boxing type stuff to taking them to the ground? Are there any certain tells there? Oh, yeah, like your stance changes. You can kind of tell the striker from the grappler just based off of how they hold their hands and how they spread their legs and what they're, who's controlling the what corner of the cage and whatnot. Uh, but like I said earlier, like it's becoming less and less evident because they're becoming more and more alike. Mm-hmm. But there's absolutely certain styles that favor certain stances. And What kind of role does the corner man play during a fight usually? See a big factor? You know, that's one of the most interesting aspects of fighting to me and is the one that no one ever talks about. I have never seen anyone talk about this, but it's huge. It has to do with social dynamics during camp. And you'd be surprised on how many people who are coaches are coaches, not because they're good coaches, but because they're good friends with the wife. I'm serious. I'm not even making mm. this up. They're good friends with the wife. They're, they're friendly with the kids. They're friends with mm. the friends. And a lot of it has to do more with social intelligence then it has to do with actual skills. You'd be surprised on how many people are. I mean, I, I've seen people get called good coaches, and I'm just, I know fighting, and I'm just listening to them. Like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But he's getting away with it because he's very likable, he's, he's very witty, and he's got the right kind of charisma, right? And he becomes sort of a father figure. Um, I think that there's a very thin line between, you know, a guy who's a good psychologist, a good father figure. And a con artist and a cult leader. Like, there's, to me, these things, there's sort of overlapping there. You know, like sometimes I see these guys and they speak with such confidence. And because people don't know enough about fighting, they just listen to them. Oh, this guy's speaking with such confidence. You know, it goes back to that body language and facial expression thing we were talking about. Like, they speak like with absolute certainty. And then mm-hmm. I'm almost being enchanted. And the next thing you know, I'm like, wait a second, I know fighting. I know he's this guy's. I'm about to be duped here. And, but like, I have like a really good radar for that because I know what I'm talking about. But like 99.9% of people don't. So people that good get a rep for being good coaches aren't necessarily good coaches. They just have a high degree of social intelligence. Um, I, going back to your question about like, you know, when it comes to coaching, I think that fighters feed off more of that emotional support of that father like figure than they do uh, the actual instruction. I think the emotional support is a key factor here. Ultimately, you want someone in your corner who you trust. And it doesn't have, doesn't have to be a good coach. Sometimes it's just a person. Sometimes it's your dad. Like sometimes it's someone that if that person tells you to go right, you want to go with your eyes closed. And you want to ab- absolutely be able to trust that person. And this, sometimes that person is not giving the best advice, but he speaks with confidence. And you believe that right is better than left. And there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of people that it's just you'd be surprised at how emotionally needy fighters are. And it's not because it's that I mean, let me rephrase that. How emotionally needy fighting makes you fighting makes you because it is so draining on you. Like you have any idea how terrifying I mean, for me at least, it's a terrifying step in the cage against a guy who's been training his whole life to knock your head off. Like it's a very, very scary thing to do. And it's yeah, that I mean, how many people die doing MMA? Very few, but it doesn't matter, man. Like, you know, compare that to most, like some people get nervous, like doing an exam in school, like, bro, that's nothing, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. And, and 
but it's it's a very very intimidating thing, even for the most seasoned fighters. But I think that having someone in the corner that gives you that emotional support, and I really you know emphasis on you know the term father figure, it it that's the most under talked uh, aspect of fighting, in my opinion. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense. It just must it must be just so emotionally uh, draining, and and I've read that too that the you know managing those emotions is is one of the key parts of you know being successful too is like just being able to manage all that that huge amount of emotions that everybody feels yeah no i i it's it, it, absolutely and some of the best i honestly for speaking for myself i feel that if had i had that i had good teachers but and i had people who gave me that emotional support for brief periods of time but early on i became a coach i became the person giving that emotional support and i left nothing for myself but I had it for my own career. Had I been more selfish, I think I would have gone a lot further in MMA. Uh, you know, and it goes back to a different, like, it brings me to a different discussion. But, like, sometimes selfishness is a quality. It's not always a bad thing. And, you know, but I think that had I had that emotional support, I think I would have gone a lot further. But I was, for large periods of my career, I was my own coach. And that's very difficult to do. Hmm. Gotcha. Getting into some more self-defense real world questions. These might not be the best questions, but we'll see what you make of them. Uh, are there any, you know, if you're in a, like a, a real world situation, are there any kind of tells you can look for when someone's about to sucker punch you or something like that? You know, I, I grew up in Brazil. So, uh, you know, you develop this 360 awareness of the room because of the violence there. Like I, I don't have that here. I feel like my radars are off in the U.S. because I don't feel like I'm never feeling danger here. But in Brazil, like I walk the streets, I'm like constantly looking over my shoulder. Like you kind of develop that. In certain environments, I do the same. Like I try to have my back against the wall. Like I'm always watching the door. Like I never try to sit with my back to the door. Little mm -hmm. like silly things to most people, but to me, they're like, you know what, man? Like you never know, right? Um, I. I mean, if it's coming from behind, there's not a lot I can do. But normally, you know, most situations, something happens. The guy is just at least checking you out. Like, I can tell when the guy's looking at me in an athletic way. And that's when I kind of, like, I get into my stance as well. Like, I, you know, because I'm like, not literally, but I flex my muscles. You know, I'm like, all right, I'm ready for you, man. If you want trouble, you, you got it. And I think that's a better defense. Other than just leaving. If you're okay with just leaving, then just leave. Um, but, like, I think that's a better response than showing – fear because people bullies feed off of that right the bully feeds off of fear like i teach this women's self-defense seminar the first thing we teach women is teach them how to put their hands up you don't have to know how to throw them but just throwing showing your hands to someone goes whoa there's this is not going to go out without a fight because mm -hmm. anyone who's going to sucker punch you or attack you for the most part i feel that they are more likely to do it if you show fear if you show that you're not going to fight back if you show that you are an easy target Whereas if you show no, I will bite your face off if you come near me. I think you are far less likely to, you know, do anything to you. Yeah, there's probably some. Uh, I'd imagine there's some like uh, effective, you know, just acting crazy type stuff. If you know, if you were in a, a a rough situation, just to just to intimidate them and let them know, like, oh, this person might be pretty crazy. You yeah. know, <laughs> the one exception I make to this is I feel it's an environment where guns or knives may be involved. I I just then I don't try to flex muscles. I'll just leave. I don't, I'm not I'm not going to take that chance. Uh, if I'm in a place where, you know, if I'm sometimes in a different country, I don't know anyone. He's like, what, man? Better safe than sorry. I have no issues just turning my back and, and leaving. I don't have any securities in that regard. I think the best form of self defense is track field, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's really the best form of self defense there is. Uh, I don't have any securities as far as, like, you know, if I have to just turn my back and walk away. I know I can beat 99.999% of the people on the planet. Like I have the people who can beat me are people fighting UFC and that's about it. So I don't worry about that. But like every now and then you get that guy that tries to test you and I'm going, oh, this is not worth my time. Like I'm all dressed up. I got my girlfriend here and you know, and next thing you know, I hurt the guy who guess who gets in trouble. You know, the guy right. professionally, of course, you know, in this crazy world we live in, like you're automatically the bad guy because you know, you punch people in the face for a living. Right, and, right. You know, I just rather avoid. That happened a while ago. Like me and my girlfriend were walking around. The guy messed with her right in front of me, and I, I think I flipped the guy off, and I got into a scrap with him and his friend. And um, 
you know, like the, the, the police came and they actually sided with me. It was like it was the camera. It was very obvious that they were the ones who started it. And I was just really defending myself and my girl. But uh, I, I hurt one of them. The other one kind of got away. But I, I'm still like, I'm not like, I, I hate those experiences, man. Like sometimes I don't want to go out because I just don't want to go have to go through the risk of something like that happening. I don't want to have to hurt anyone. I just, I might find out I want to have a good time, man. That's really what I want to do. I train, I'm in the gym every day. I've been in the gym every day for 21 years. The last thing I want to do is fight on the weekend. But, you know, sometimes you have to. You know. So uh, when you lived in Brazil, were there people that, or even when you lived elsewhere, are there people that, uh, you know, would would target you or, or because they know you were a fighter? Is like a challenge kind of thing? Well, I, it's, it's with some places, you know, um, Brazil less because fighters are very respected there. Um, so less so, like people are actually scared to kind of stay clear, because uh, I think in the U.S. more so than Brazil. I think because deep down the the people who's gonna people are gonna pick a fight with you. They know that ultimately the police will protect them. The bouncers are gonna jump in, mm. and they can sue you if they want. You know, like in Brazil that shit doesn't fly. The police is gonna be too late. No one's gonna intervene. You're actually gonna have to fight. <laughs> no one's gonna. Mm. <laughs> you know, your friends probably won't help you, and you don't. No people don't carry guns um, unless you're a criminal. Um, so it's one of those things like, oh man, you want to fight, you're going to actually have to fight for real now, you know? And then it's almost like, even though a law is less efficient there, I think in some ways it works better because people are like, oh, I don't want to go through with this because I'm actually going to have to fight that guy. Right. It's kind of like the old world, you know, the old, the old days, like you, you don't want to start a blood feud or who knows what, you know, like, you know how it's going to end where is like, yeah. you know, uh, you know, you, I feel like some people will pick a fight with you because deep down they know that. You know the, the security is going to stop it like that's happened before at nightclubs the guy mm-hmm. in a fight with me and i'm just just trying to flex his muscle in front of his girlfriend and friends and i'm like this guy knows that nothing's going to happen he knows that this fight is not going to go for more than 10 seconds right he's got a safety net yeah, yeah but like i i, yeah. I, I the truth story, man i actually handed the guy this guy a business card like if you want to fight me show up my gym tomorrow sign a waiver and we'll fight <laughs> and he's just like staring at me like i'm crazy like, i'm fucking serious because like i would like someone in that environment like you do it the right way but I don't want to, like I said, if I go out, like the last thing I want is, you know, right. risk, you know, getting myself hurt or someone hurt for, you know, for, for stupid reasons. Yeah. And I'd imagine, I mean, you, you're in Vegas, so I imagine that's even more likely to happen where there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of inebriated people uh, looking to show off and stuff, you know? Yeah. I, I, you know, people drink, they get brave. The when they're around their friends and, and, you know, alcohol is involved, they, they get really courageous. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so. Any other things you wanted to discuss that you think I, I skipped over would that would be good uh, conversation topics? Uh, I were well. The only thing we're promoting, I promote. I mean, I have a gym in Las Vegas. If you're ever in Las Vegas, uh, you're more than welcome. Drives of Jiu Jitsu, come by, check it out. It, it, we're on Hair and Rainbow. Everyone's welcome. We have classes for children, women. Um, you know, an executive class, competition class, an MMA class beginners class you name it right we have class for all sorts of uh, different demographics i'm also promoting a documentary film we're working on relates to the your, your first question about the origins of mma and brazilian jiu-jitsu we're working on documentary production that tells that story and uh, so it's called closed guard the origins of jiu-jitsu in brazil and we don't have a release date yet we're currently editing the film it's something we put a lot of time and, and, and energy in. so your gym the website is drysdalejujitsu.com right. and you can follow Robert also on Twitter. It's just Robert Drysdale. Yep. So uh, any anything else you want to mention? No, that'd be it. Thank you for having me. Uh, shout out to Elliot, bro. Um, yeah, thanks, Elliot. Yeah, and um, yeah, if any of you guys are in Vegas, come visit. Yeah, I was I was thinking too, like we have a lot of poker players that listen and uh, yeah, it might be good to swing by there and and do some uh, get some lessons there while they're in town for the WSU or something. You're welcome. We'll, we'll get a group session going. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, Robert. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Zach. This has been the People Who Read People podcast with Zach Elwood. And if you play poker at all, you might like my Poker Tells Behavior books. You can find them on Amazon or on my website, readingpokertells.com. I've also got a video series at readingpokertells.video. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe to it or leave a review or a rating. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Bye.